Hello again, Sandwich. I'm Greg Anderson. Welcome in to season three of Ask the Soup. This is a damn good show. It's very popular. <laughs> Did you see we won an Emmy for Two Old Guys Talking? Our soundtrack is on Spotify, and there is a movie being made of our show. Think Wayne's World, but with <laughs> Gene Hackman and Brad Pitt, I'm just saying. Gene Hackman, really? Yeah, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Let's talk schools, sandwich schools with Dr. Joe. Don't call me Gene Hackman, Marushchek. Welcome back, my friend. Great to see you. How Great are you? Great to see you. I'm well. I'm very well. How was the summer? It was good, and, and as I typically say, way too short. Um, it flew by, but um, things went extremely well. Yeah. So I will just say my 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 quick thought is you kind of land now you you work twelve months a year this, I do you, yeah you're, I do you're not off and many of yeah. your administration is the same but you did kind of land back in the school year busy yeah you have a lot of things going on a lot of a uh, lot of projects going yeah. on a lot of carryover of the things from the spring, uh, commitments to follow through on, and so yeah. on. So yes, we definitely hit the ground running. So what would you say are, say, three things that you're focusing on this year that are an ultimate priority for you? I would say first and foremost, um, kind of doing a complete reboot slash rebuild of our district strategic plan. Okay. Um, if you think about it, you really need to define some very, very concrete goals as far as what is both the short-term and long-term vision of the district. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that piece is important. I think the second piece is continue planning and investment in our school facilities and infrastructure, yeah. something that you know, we've kind of been beating the drum with, uh, you know, at least since the start of my tenure in July of 22, mm -hmm. um, and I know it's a key priority for our school committee. Yeah. Um, and I think you know, we're, we're very fortunate to work with our select board and our finance committee mm -hmm. that's been very, very receptive to kind of have a collaborative problem solving approach. Yeah. And then I think third, um, continuing the work to ensure that our schools are safe mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, the forward progress that we've made with regard to school safety, yeah. um, you know, fortifying our schools to a greater degree, making sure both our students and staff are prepared yeah. through active drill planning, but also the piece, you know, and I know we talked about this in the spring um, with the really unfortunate situation that we had um, with the baseball team, yeah. uh, ensuring that our kids socially, emotionally are, safety, uh, are, are safe as well. And some of that ongoing work around harassment and bullying and that being at the fore as well. So what are the lessons learned from last year's incident? Because not only did you guys have a, a bullying incident down the road in Mashpee. Sure. They, I mean, and then- It's endemic. It's endemic. What did you, what lessons learned, maybe even the better question is, what new systems are in place? Systems may, may or may not be the right word. Um, this year and going forward as a result of what happened with the incident on the bus? I think it is, like most things in life, it is messaging, it's communication, keeping things in the fore. Um, I think some of the feedback that we got, uh, the deeper we got into this as far as making our student family handbooks a lot more user friendly, a oh, lot more clear and easy uh, to read and to understand and to process, particularly in the event if your child is going through this type of situation. Yeah. With regard to sports, I give our uh, athletic director at the high school, Sean Donovan, a lot of credit. We've implemented a new program where all student athletes are gonna be taking kind of like this three course, three courses through the National Federation of High School Athletics um, organization, three online courses to compete. So their coursework around sportsmanship, around use of social media, mm -hmm. and around bullying and hazing type issues. Um, so again, I think we're only scratching the surface. I think yeah. we've got a lot more work to do with regard to staff professional development, 
coach professional development yeah. and putting those pieces together, but I think we need to keep it at the fore. Yeah. You had a, um, an incident um, this week. Uh, it really, uh, I was gonna say it blew up on social media, but it, it, oh, I'm talking about the student threat mm -hmm. uh, situation. I wouldn't say it really blew up on, so it blew up in one thread of sandwich scoop. Mm -hmm. But words, words are pretty powerful, and there seemed to be a lot of frustration, parents asking what's going on, sure. what did you hear, mm -hmm. therefore confusion, a lot of chatter. There's, there's a couple things I wanted to ask you. What happened, and is this social media thing hurting your efforts to bring clarity or, uh, well, clarity? Uh, to a situation where you need to be private, yeah, but you also need to be very transparent. Sure. Um, I, I I shared with people that um, you know back to I I don't think I'm anywhere near as old as Gene Hackman, but um, <laughs> I shared with people this week that I became a principal in 2001. So I, I I've been at this for a while and. I worked in my former life, I, I was a principal in Rhode Island and I was also a principal at Mansfield High School. And I, I, I can say with a high degree of comfort that if the year was 06, 07 and this in incident happened, um, we probably wouldn't have sent out a message to all parents. Hmm. I think unfortunately in the day and age that we live in uh, with the threat of school shootings and school violence, um, we do need to have a layer of transparency. Mm -hmm. You balance that with um, student privacy, you balance that with um, knowing the full context of statements that were made, uh, the context of challenges that a student may or may not have, and so on, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, it is very challenging. And realize any statements that go out from the school, and I worked very closely with uh, Principal Jeannie Nelson, um, we used very much a measured approach in what we are putting out Mm -hmm. to families. Mm -hmm. um, probably over this weekend, I, I, I'm going to um, send out something district-wide, realize that this, um, these communications went strictly to the middle high school staff. And in part, to your original question, Greg, um, we had to put them out because of Snapchats and other social media means we're putting out misinformation yeah. about the situation. And that becomes something that's very unfortunate. Yeah. Um, because to a certain degree, people are kind of creating their own reality. And, yeah. and that doesn't necessarily purport with what is happening. Um, you know, we've, talk, we've talked about this in, in the past as it relates <clears throat> to the social media dynamic and pick a business, pick an industry, mm -hmm. pick a political you know, persuasion. But when you're talking about um, the, the school systems uh, and you're a parent, and we have both been parents of mm -hmm. kids in, in schools, uh, there's a degree of, I know better. I'm a parent, I know better. Sure. And I know what you should be saying to me, and therefore, because you're not, shame on you. Mm -hmm. that, kind of swirls out there in the forever world of social media. Does that make you crazy? It does make you crazy, but you always have to remember depth and breadth. Okay, so something that I can quote to you as a statistic. Uh, at current time, there are 893 uh, students at Sandwich Middle High School. Um, Jeannie Nelson and myself combined received, I want to say maybe 16 or 17 emails based upon that event. Mm. So, and realized the overwhelming majority of emails had a tone and tenure of, thank you so much for the communication. Okay. I really appreciate that. And then maybe asked a question or two, right. most related to safety and security. So I think you always have to have 
context and you can't go to the Sandwich Scoop or Sandwich School's bulletin and read something from an anonymous poster yeah. and think, oh, that's indicative of the overwhelming majority yeah. of uh, the families that we serve. I feel, and, and I know I can say this with a high degree of confidence, the overwhelming majority of the families that we serve um, are fair and reasonably minded people and they process things and they understand things. Yeah. So you really can't allow um, people who live on social media who may or may not say inflammatory things to kind of shape your worldview and, yeah. and as a result shape the decisions that you make and so on. So this was one student, one threat, if you will. And I know you can't get into mm -hmm. the sure. because what's interesting is I was reading over some of my notes for this. I was thinking, if I asked you a very specific question and you said I can't tell you the kid's name, but um, yes, he rode a pink donkey into the gym. Yeah, everyone is going to say, I know that kid that rode the pink donkey into the gym. I know him. <laughs> he's a, he's my son's friend. Yeah, he, and you know, so I don't want you to be putting yourself in a jam by by saying sure. anything. Sure, but. Tell me what happened, if you can, to the best of your ability. I think what happened was um, something to the effect of a verbal, um, verbal exchange between students and one student made uh, a comment that wasn't necessarily specific to a weapon, but almost kind of was like a veiled a threat or a veiled illusion to something that could happen. Okay. And, and realize, you know, when something like that happens, we work very, very closely. We're, we're fortunate enough now to have two school resource officers. Yeah. We work pretty much hand in glove with the sandwich police yeah. to, um, you know, assess the nature of the threat, to pull family the family into the fold mm -hmm. to do something like a home visit and all yeah. of those pieces um, and you know in and, 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 and a communication a follow-up communication you know to, to reassure families you know we made it very very clear if there is an ongoing investigation or uh, you know something that's deemed to be a threat the student is not permitted on school premises and so okay. on. So, um, Is there an investigation underway? There is, okay. very much so. Okay. And um, again, there's a larger context here yeah. and so on. And I get that piece that you're saying, Greg, that sandwich is small enough and, and kids know each other, staff know each other yeah. and so on. Um, <laughs> that, you know, there, there's hardly anonymity here. Right. Um, right. right. But let me flip it in the other, uh, the other way. And um, my interpretation of this is extremely positive, and, and I have shared this with the school committee. Because of that smallness, because of that intimacy that we have in our community, um, I do have an extremely high degree of confidence in our staff. Mm. Um, if and when there are red flags with students um, of behavior that is troubling, behavior that could uh, be somewhat threatening or, or anything in the least bit, I have a high degree of confidence that our staff are on top of things. Yeah. You know, so, some of the things that I've seen um, circulating in social media, some of the things that, you know, I've had some folks reach out to me via email and so on, particularly after this last shooting in Georgia at that Appalachee High School. Mm -hmm. um, a very, very different context, a very, very large high school, you know, over 1,600 students. Um, a, a, a lot of, in many ways, dissimilar to the context that we have in Sandwich. Right. Um, I, I, again, 
I do, you know, you can have all the security measures in place and, you know, again, we do everything in our power to always, as I say, move the, the ball down the field yeah. and, and improve our practices, but nothing substitutes, there is no substitute for knowing your students and knowing them well. Yeah. And I think that's something that we do remarkably well here. You have, uh, did you say earlier that you made some enhancements to school security, the f physical mm -hmm. uh, systems? Mm -hmm. what's, what's been done? The, the big thing is, and if you recall, the, through the FY25 um, budget process, you know, we worked with the select board and the FinCom uh, for an increased uh, allocation for capital funding mm -hmm. uh, for this school year, uh, prioritizing safety upgrades. Um, some major safety upgrades have been done vis-a-vis -vis our security camera system, uh, completely digitizing it, oh, cool. um, probably by a factor of at least 50 or 60% more cameras with much better coverage, much better access. Um, also having an interface with our key fob system and our check-in, check-out system as well. So we really, in a very robust fashion, upgraded that. Also some significant upgrades to uh, locking systems, uh, internal locks of In classrooms. classroom doors. Correct. Yeah, okay. Which must give reassurance to, to teachers. Yes. Who are, you know, the whole security thing. Sure. I want to change subjects. Um, the cell phone issue, mm -hmm. um, because oh, by the way, you're trying to educate kids and sure. keep them from a distraction-free zone sure. as much as possible. Sure. Over the summer, uh, you updated the policy with the school committee on the use of personal electronics. I thought it was just cell phones, but it's it's laptops, earbuds. I mean, all it, of that stuff. All yeah. of that personal electronics. Sure. How'd that go over, my friend? Well, so far, so good. I mean, I think we're, today as we tape this, this might be something like day 19 of the school year. Uh, but the feedback overwhelmingly um, has been positive. I know, you know, we still have some students that would probably bear to, um, <laughs> who would, would tend to disagree. That, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, statistically, uh, you know, G Jeannie Nelson has shared a couple numbers that I think are remarkable. Day one, I think we had a total of five phones confiscated. Um, I think as of two days ago, so as of less, something like 17 school days, the total number was like 19 phones wow. confiscated. And again, our student population is 893. I uh, realized for grades seven and eight, this was a policy that was already in place. Um, you know, and, and, and I think you know, I, I have the opportunity two or three times a week, I do walkthroughs of the school. Um, I go into uh, classrooms. It generally has not been an issue. Um, Where are these being caught? Like when kids are, how, how does the process work? I, I, so, so uh, you know, and, and I think it's a credit to the staff, but it's also a credit to our kids as well. Um, there are some classrooms where they've kind of have like, you know, think about maybe the hanging shoe thing where, yeah. you know, kids can place there. But generally it's like, look, um, during the course of the uh, school day, thou shalt not have your cell phone. So I think most kids keep them in their backpack. Um, we've made it clear that um, between those hours of 7.30 to 2, even during passing time, even during um, lunch, they're not permitted. And um, the anecdotal feedback that I've gotten from uh, the teaching staff there has been beyond positive. Has it been difficult for any of the students who may need have that sense of I, I got to connect with my mom, I've got the dentist appointment, they're picking me up. Uh, has it been a problem? Oh I'm sure with some it has been yeah. but I, I, I think the flip side is with some it's a little bit of a relief that they're yeah. realizing some students have gone as far as to say yeah I kind of get it now that there is a little bit of an addiction here. Yeah. But the flip side is I've heard from teachers like, oh my God, the, the amount of kids that are actually 
participating and engaging. I was going to ask and you about they, that. And they're actually speaking yeah. to each other and actually making eye contact with each other yeah. and so on. Yeah. So again, we're still very, very early in this process, yeah. but it's been overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. And you know, if you've just caught anything in the national media, this is not a, just a sandwich thing. It's not just a regional right. thing. It's kind of across the country yeah. that this huge, um, you know, gestalt shift has been made yeah. to kind of say enough is enough with this. Well, kids are, there's no question, kids are cell phone addicts. They mm -hmm. are TikTok addicts. The, it is the way in which they make their decisions in life. My kids are like this. Yep. I think I am on some level, but um, my wife probably thinks it's a big level, but <laughs> I, you know. I, I, Get I, off the Facebook, Greg. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but I think it's a normalizing effect when you take everybody's phones away. It's almost like school uniforms. Correct. You know, when Great everyone's analogy. in a uniform, no one has a chance to be able to say, you know, I don't like your shirt. Yeah. Um, so, um, so you feel good about the policy? I feel You're going in the right direction. Extremely positive about um, the policy, and I think over time, um, people will look back and say, "Yeah, remember, you know, we, we we kind of had that experiment, and you know, and honestly, a lot of it was driven through the pandemic, and you know, oh, the, yeah. the the feeling to have one to one, and you know, that connectivity." Yeah. Um, but I, th there, there's elements where we definitely need to get back to basics. Yeah. Let's talk about enrollment. What are we looking at this year? How are we doing? So, um, at, you know, the uh, enrollment is not official official until October 1st, but as I usually do in September, um, I share what we started with on day one. We started this year with 2,150 students. Uh, that represents six fewer than our official October 1st enrollment of 2,156 last year. So I would characterize that our enrollment's pretty stable. Six. Six now, fewer. Do you, do you know where they went? Do you, is it dad got relocated to Idaho, so they had to move? We do. Or? I mean, we do have that at the granular level. Yeah. And where, again, that migration is in that eighth to ninth grade. Right. So. Um, you know, where students go, they opt for something like Upper Cape Tech, right. they opt for Sturgis, right. or some other private, um, you know, private or parochial school option. I was interested in the homeschooling discussion. <coughs> uh, mm -hmm. Right now, 57 students in Sandwich are enrolled uh, as homeschooled, which is down from 99 in 2021-22, 63 in 22-23, mm -hmm. 66 in 23-24. And of course, during COVID, it was 152. Sure, yeah. Totally makes sense. Yep. But 57 homeschooled, homeschooled students this year, what does that say to you? What's that number mean to you? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I think it is, you know, I. You could do a little study slash meta-analysis of um, what that means with, res uh, you know, how does sandwich um, relate to, you know, similar communities regionally, demographically, and so on. Um, I think it's a snapshot of the times. Um, I think some families homeschool their children for religious reasons. Um, I think sometimes the religion also crosses into the political sphere as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, it's a whole multitude of reasons. Um, most often I find it's either for religious or kind of a, a, a social view of the world. Right. Um, Is so, there more of a temperament to keep your kid home these days? Is there more of an appetite to, to say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm just gonna do it myself. I think it increased through the pandemic. I think uh, there, there is a thread, Greg, here that it is definitely uh, reflective of political divide and kind of views um, 
in, in many cases of how the political right will view public education right. and so on. So uh, there's definitely that element. I mean, you know, I think families have chose, uh, chosen to homeschool their children for Forever. a long, long time. Yeah. Yeah. But I think probably, you know, the pandemic and, uh, you know, um, some of the suspicions around, you know, what was happening in schools and so on, uh, increased some of those numbers. So the DEI issue, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, gender issues, mm -hmm. uh, what teachers are teaching is the hard right that you're referring to. Yeah, kind of like or sometimes you, you, you would hear, well, you know, I don't want my child uh, exposed to that. You know, there's indoctrination going on uh, right. of my right. children and so on. That's an element, and, and I want to be very, very clear that by no means is the majority. It's all 57. Of, uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think there's, uh, you know, uh, the majority of families homeschool their children in good faith in the sense right. that they have um, a, a, a certain worldview, they have a, a, a certain way that they would like to raise their children, including right. how they receive educational services. So is 57 out of 2,000, whatever the number was, is that a high number? Is that a high ratio? Um, Low? You know, my context is um, my previous district, which was Menden Upton Regional, which um, is crazy similar to mm. Sandwich as far as enrollment numbers and um, demographics and so on, it's a little bit higher than what I was used to during those years. Okay. You know, it was in the ballpark of 40 to 45, so a little bit higher. Okay. Do, do you oversee, if I, if, if my kid is being homeschooled in, in my home and I live in Sandwich, does, does your administration oversee what I do? So, um, How does that work? It, it does. It technically is um, overseen and approved by the superintendent uh, or his or her designee, in this case Dave Quinn, who is yeah. our assistant superintendent, is the point person. So under our policy, um, the um, family needs to submit something called a home instruction plan. Okay. And um, at each year kind of outlaying the curriculum of what's gonna be handled and so on. And then also a, a, a strategy that shows how learning is going to be assessed. And then at the end of the school year, uh, a progress report, basically. You mentioned uh, Assistant Superintendent uh, Dave Quinn. He, back in August, he did a uh, Q&A with some students mm -hmm. and incoming yeah. teachers. Um, and and uh, it looked like we have Shiloh Chambers, uh, Coraline Goers, Rocco Boccolini. Uh, 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 Boccolini. Um, April Reisig, Prisha Barasaria. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brendan Cronin and Alexandra Eastman. You got some good feedback. It sounds like it was a wonderful discussion, but it made me think. The, the comments seemed very um, positive. It seemed very, it, certainly necessary for incoming teachers to hear. But how, what is the process of learning what kids are fearful about or concerned about? School safety, bullying, um, you know, is there a mechanism and, and, or is it by exception when something happens or a kid has a concern? How does the school district understand that there are X number of kids out in schools today as we speak who are thinking, I don't want this to be a, you know, my last day on earth. I sure. don't want this to be a true sure. crisis. Sure. So there, uh, there's a bunch of mechanisms, you know, uh, the, the, a, a simple one is, and you know, I carried this over from Dr. Gould uh, after she retired, but on a monthly basis, I meet with a group of students. It's called the Superintendent's Advisory Committee. Um, we meet um, the last Friday of every month, and uh, I expanded it last year. I've got 
50, about 15 kiddos on it from every single grade, kind of every different walk of life. So a lot of it is just kind of getting that direct feedback. But realize too, we also survey kids. You know, we, we gave something called the Panorama School Climate Survey hmm. to all of the students at the middle high school. Um, we're looking to expand it this school year. We're probably gonna go down to Oak Ridge, but we're also going to survey families as yeah. well. So we've got those ongoing mechanisms to kind of in a systematic way to get, to get those feedbacks, particularly around climate and culture issues. Okay, so you got a system in place, plus you have teachers who are trained to listen for certain things. Of course. Um, okay, uh, you have two new assistant principals. I do. A and um, no, one, no one can really <laughs> see here the picture. Look at that, but, good, look at that good looking guy on yeah, that key five. But you know? I have now become uh, the superintendent. And you've got the God key. Like you can get into anything with that. Oh, is yeah. this a key? It is. That's, that's, part, of, that's part of our uh, security yeah. system where it's not only an ID, but it's also a key fob to get into doors. Oh, look <laughs> at what I am holding in my hand. All right, tell me about, uh, aside from Greg Anderson named the new superintendent, uh, tell me about Josh uh, Clarkin and Mary Kate Stevens. Great people, great uh, educators who come to us with a wealth of experience, and they also live here in town. Mm -hmm. um, have, uh, in, in Josh's case, has children in the district. Uh, Mary Kate has two little ones, uh, but you know, before you know it, they'll be starting at Forestdale. Um, but anyway, Josh is an experienced. Uh, guidance counselor, and uh, I, I wanna say close to about 20 years, 19 years or something like that, has been at uh, Dennis Yarmouth Regional High School as uh, a guidance counselor, but then assistant principal. Um, just comes to us not only with that wealth of experience, but just the temperament, the temperament for the position. So he came to us very, very highly recommended, um, has three daughters, two have already gone through. Um, the baby, I wanna say, I wanna say she's a sophomore this year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, through the interview process, Josh talked about like, you know, I kinda had to get permission from my daughter, and oh, but she said, go for it, and oh, so on. that's great. So um, I think he's an absolute uh, perfect fit. Um, Mary Kay Stevens, Dr. Mary Kay Stevens, comes yeah. to us from Falmouth. Um, where she had uh, a very successful career as an elementary teacher, but then over the last couple of years, she moved into kind of a curriculum uh, assistant role at central office. Hmm. So she's had a nice background uh, administratively, but yeah. also I know her heart and soul is in the classroom. Um, so super pleased, and yeah. they seem to be as, uh, assimilating very, very well. Well, it sounds like you are pleased with your, the team surrounding you because I am. while you're sitting here representing, and you are the superintendent, you represent the, the district, but you have an army behind you. Well, I don't know if I'd quite say it's an army, <laughs> but uh, some very, uh, a good, uh, solid team of yeah. people that are really focused on the right targets. So if I needed to go into the supply cabinet and get myself some pencils. Post-it notes. Post-it notes. Will this do it? Uh, it certainly will. All right. <laughs> You'll see me down on Quaker Meeting House Road in a little bit. Uh, Dr. Joe, welcome back to the school year. Great to be here. I mean, can cable access TV get any better than no. this? No, no, no. <sighs> and, and strangely, you do look a little like Gene Hackman in here. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Maybe French Connection era. Okay, Poseidon Adventure? Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Hey, uh, Sandwich, um, I will see you soon. Thank you so much for joining us on our first episode of season three of Ask the Soup. We'll see you next time.